this video, I'm going to show you how to calculate sample size needed for a study. So let's pretend we want to do a study where we're going to use a one group pretest post test design. That is, we're going to have one group, they're going to complete a pretest survey or questionnaire. Then they're going to go through an intervention or treatment, and then we're going to collect post test data after they've all gone through the treatment. This is also considered a baseline follow-up type of design. Now in class, we talked a lot about the limitations of this type of design and the fact with any one group pretest post-test design, it's going to have low internal validity because there are so many threats to internal validity. I would encourage you to go back and review the threats to internal validity for a one group pretest post-test design. In any case, what I want to be able to do is calculate the sample size needed for my own study that I'm going to do in a couple of weeks. So let's pretend I'm going to do a study looking at uh, changes in nutritional knowledge among high school students. And I need to calculate the sample size that I'm going to need in order to know how many participants I'm going to need to participate in my study. Now, I don't want to commit a type one or a type two error. If you don't remember what a type one and type two error are, I would encourage you to go back and review your notes and view the textbook on what a type one and type two error is and the significance of type errors. So one way that I can calculate the sample size needed for a study that I'm going to conduct is I can use information from previous studies. Now, normally when we do this, we want to take maybe the average of two or three different studies. And so what I might do is find two or three different studies that are all using the same dependent variable. And in this example, I'm going to use a measure of nutrition knowledge and calculate the sample size needed from that data. Now, I'm only going to do it for this one particular study, but again, in practice, we would do it three times and then take the average of the sample size that we computed um, from each of the three studies. So we'll take the average. But let me show you how you would do it for an individual uh, study. So you can see in this study, they have this program called the Superstar Chef. It's a youth nutrition education program, and they were looking at it to affect students' nutritional knowledge, their food preparation skills, cooking self-efficacy, and intention to eat fruits and vegetables. You can see they're using a one group pretest post test design and they collected data on nutritional knowledge and cooking self efficacy and the like. You can see that they had 495 third grade through sixth grade students that participated in the study. And you can see these are the tools or the items that they use to measure nutritional knowledge, as well as cooking self-efficacy, so on and, and so forth. So in the results section of every study, they're always going to report the means and the standard deviations for each of the groups. And it'll either be in the table or it could be in the narrative of the results section. So what I want to do is calculate the sample size needed for a study that I'm going to do. And I'm going to use the data here specifically the means and standard deviations for each group. The means are here, the standard deviations are here. And I'm going to use that to calculate the sample size needed. Now remember, when we calculate sample size, we need um, four things. We need beta, which is statistical power, a measure of effect size, like uh, Cohen's D, which is here. Um, the correlation coefficient R is a measure of effect size. Eta in a one-way analysis of variance is a measure of effect size. There's a number of measures of effect sizes that we can use. The most common ones for looking at differences between two means is going to be Cohen's D. Now, you can calculate Cohen's D if you know the, the T-score as well if, as you know the exact probability that the effect is due to random variation although they're just telling us that the probability is less than 0.001. So the best way to do this is to use G-Power to calculate the effect size for you and then also calculate the sample size needed. So let's swing over and look at 
g power. So once we open up g power, we can calculate the sample size needed for a study. And the first thing we need to do is specify the type of test that would be used. So if you have a one group pretest, post test design, you're going to analyze that using some type of t test, right? Specifically a paired samples t test. And then you need to specify the type of t test. So it defaults on correlation. You'll need to go down and go ahead and go to means, differences between two dependent means match pairs, because remember each subject is giving you two scores, so you end up with match or paired uh, data here. And you'll see here we can specify um, the effect size that we need, the alpha level, which is part of our beans, and then power. Um, you need to set power at 0 0.80. For some reason it defaults at 0.95, but set your power at 0 0.80. That's what we talked about in class and which is commonly used. Again, your alpha is always 0 0.05, but we need to change the effect size coefficient. Now, if we knew the effect size coefficient, like they've, they've given it a, us here, um, then we could just plug that in. But oftentimes, I would say 99% of the time, when you're looking at an article, it's not going to give it to you. That's why we're going to use the means and the standard deviations to calculate the sample size needed. And so we can click on this button here where it says determine. So we can determine the effect size that we that we need. And so I'm going to try to do this. I'll move the screen back and forth so you can see it. But if we look, we can see that the mean at pretest was 5.45 with a standard deviation of 0.93. And the mean at post-test for nutritional knowledge was 5.68 with a standard deviation of 0 0.64. So I can put that those numbers in here. So I'll put the mean for the first group, which is going to be 5.45. And I'll put in the mean of the second group, which is 5.68. And let's go back and, and see if that's correct. Okay, so now we'll put the standard deviation for the first group which is 0 0.93, and we'll put the standard deviation in for the second group, which is 0 0.64. Now, the other th thing that you'll need to specify when you are calculating the sample size needed using G power for a paired samples t-test is the correlation between the groups. Now, it defaults at 0 0.50, but most of the time, the scores for um, the pre- and post-test scores, because they're coming from the same person, are going to be highly correlated. So I typically will use something like 0 0.90. Then you can go here and say calculate effect size, and you can see it's 0.51. And then you can say calculate and transfer to main win window. So it calculates the effect size D here, and it transfers that effect size coefficient over to here. So now our effect size is 0.51 with alpha 0 0.05, and we've specified power or beta to be 0 0.80. Now we can click on calculate here, and it'll calculate the sample size needed. And you can see that the sample size needed would be uh, 26 subjects. You need 26 subjects to have a power of around uh, 0 0.80. Now, one of the things that I'll, I'll point out here is that we calculated the sample size to be much lower than um, what they actually um, had. There's no information in their methods about how they chose 495, but what you can see is that when you compare that to um, our calculated sample size, somewhere around um, 69, that they're way overpowered. They have way far too many subjects. So would this be a type one error or a type two error? As always, if you have questions about anything, make sure you get with me during my office hours. Have a great day.